Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to the Ann Arbor District Library this afternoon, and I hope you ate lunch, otherwise you're gonna be really hungry <laughs> by the end of this program. My name is Emily, and I'm on the events team, uh, and we are uh, really excited to uh, welcome Martin Van Dyke back to the library, who brought us this wonderful event uh, with Karen Dipus and her book, uh, Detroit Style Pizza, A Doughtown History. So uh, just a little overview of today's event. So uh, Karen has a presentation, um, she's uh, going to be uh, giving us the delicious secrets of Detroit style pizza. Um, Martin is going to be uh, asking some questions. We're gonna have a Q&A with the audience uh, after the presentation is over. I'm gonna be running around the room with a mic because we're live streaming today. So we wanna make sure that any questions that get asked get set into the mic so people who are watching from home can hear the questions. And then after Q&A, Karen will be signing books over at that table over there. Uh, we are so happy to have our friends from Book Suite yeah. here selling books today. Um, and with that, I'm gonna pass this over to Martin so he can introduce Karen. Thank you so All much. Right. Emily, thank you so much. Well, hi everybody, it's good, good to see you here on a, a beautiful autumnal Saturday afternoon. I, I've had the pleasure of hosting another event at the library. We were thinking about five years or so ago with uh, our guest Karen Divas, and uh, she, she's obviously a Detroit area based author and writer um, who has done other books on essential components of the Southeast Michigan food and culture scene, including a book about better made potato chips, near and dear to our hearts. Uh, that was our last event uh, here at the Ann Arbor Library, and also a book about the Ford Wyoming Drive-In as well, which is a really iconic uh, movie theater in my hometown of Dearborn at Ford in Wyoming. Uh, Karen's latest book, yes, about Detroit-style pizza, and uh, let's welcome Karen Dibus back to the Ann Arbor District Library. Karen. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, and thank you everybody for coming out too, because I know you don't have football to watch necessarily today, so yes. we'll try to make this as interesting. Yeah, yes. Uh, th th it's pretty obvious why you would want to do a book about Detroit-style pizza. I mean, how is it really as famous around the world as his people claim here? Is that a myth or is that is that It's real? so crazy to me. That's why I thought we had to write the book, as it were, because there was a couple other people that were under contract to write it, and then for one reason or another, in the case of the gentleman, our photos up there, let me just double check. In yeah. the middle there, there's a gentleman named Sean Randazzo. When Sean passed away in December 2020, uh, the project kind of went on hold because Sean was so important in making it a worldwide sensation. How so? What, what he had presented the pizza for competition in Las Vegas. Yes, there is an actual pizza expo twice a year. You don't just go to Vegas in March. You can also go to Atlantic City and do a pizza competition and learning uh, event. Mm -hmm. But he was the one that started teaching this method after he won at Vegas. The number one pizza was a Detroit style and he decided he had to demystify it. He wanted the whole world to understand Detroit was more than just the sum of its myths <laughs> or some of the kind of like ruined porn that you see of abandoned buildings right. or the idea that it was a crime-ridden city. He actually had pizza s people say to him, is Detroit-style pizza pizza with bullets? Oh. And he said, we oh can't have God. that. Or they assumed it was just Little Caesar. Or right. maybe Domino's, or Domino's too, because yeah. Domino is so prevalent yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. as a wonderful company. Yeah. Um, and so he wanted to make sure people understood what this was, and he wanted to take away that idea that it was a Detroit only thing. So people flew him out to tr training, and they learned how to make it to the Philippines, to South Korea, to everywhere you can imagine. And now this pizza is literally worldwide. A big chain called Emmy Squared, they're based out of New York, just opened a Detroit-style pizza place in Dubai. In Dubai, in Dubai, where they have like, I think they just want to sample the best of everything in that city. Yeah. So they have an Emmy Squared franchise there. That's so, Unbelievable. That's so cool. Yeah. Well, yeah, let, let's get into definitions. So yes. yeah, we're, we're not talking about, you know, thin, you know, traditional Little Caesars Domino's pizza. We're talking about the thick, pan-made oh, yes. pizza. What, what are some of the other defining characteristics, Karen, of a Detroit-style pizza? Well, that to me is what kind of makes this pizza special, is you, everybody knows all of the other kinds of pizza makers, right? They're round. Most everything that we eat traditionally is a New York, 
a Neapolitan, you know, whatever kind of pizza is your favorite, it's a round experience, let's say. Yeah. But when you get into the squares, that really is what is different and what stands this pizza apart. And these are kind of the holy trinity, as the Detroit News calls them, Buddy's Louis Cloverleaf. And that's what makes Detroit style Detroit style. First, it was formed and made in the city of Detroit. One of those really important things is the pans. And that is the infamous part of the story is supposedly the pans were from an automotive parts pan, you know, pan that they might have put bolts in and that supposedly got in the hands of the founder, Gus Guerra, at Buddy's Pizza in Detroit, and he started making pizza out of that. Now, I do say as a trusted so-called journalist, I've never able been able to find like that proof of that story. Mm -hmm. There's not like a receipt or a guy who said, yeah, I'm the one that snuck it out of the Ford plant mm -hmm. and brought it to the pizzeria to, for them to try. But it is one of the hallmarks. So in your Detroit style pizza, you've got high hydration dough. So if you're a, a foodie or a cook, someone who loves making pizza, it just means a lot of water to flour ratio. Makes it really light and fluffy if done okay. well. It's a square or rectangular pan, usually high walled. So think of it like a cake pan or even a bread pan because that's what I think Gus Square started with. A Little bit of angled side to that pan. So that's why if you make it at home with a cake pan, you're not necessarily gonna get that great cheese frico or crust at the edges that makes Detroit style so craveable. So that's one kind of like insider tip is if you buy those specialty pans, you might get more of that crunchy crust. Uh -huh. Pepperoni right on the crust. It's, it's called the upside down pie uh, for that crust. reason. That yeah, uh -huh. you kind of put that high fat, greasy, deliciousness that is pepperoni or sausage or whatever topping you want to put on right on the crust then brick cheese and it's not your average household cheese like you're not going to necessarily go into the local Meyer or Kroger although now that they're a little more sophisticated with their cheese areas maybe but this is usually like a cheesemonger kind of situation you got to go out of your way to find it because it's a very high fat cheese out of usually Wisconsin, Wisconsin right. um, how it got to Metro Detroit is we're still unraveling that but I do think it's because of Buddy's Pizza the, the kind of founding location or restaurant of Detroit style started using it and it's just so rich and it melts beautifully and again allows for that caramelization at the crust and then finally and this is really the hallmark that sets you apart sauce on top because we all know, like in a traditional round pizza, it's sauce, cheese, and toppings. Mm -hmm. Detroit style is upside down. We put <laughs> sauce on top at the last minute for a lot of the makers. <laughs> kind of keep that crust as crunchy as possible. You want to keep moisture away from it. Mm. So it's a really intriguing pizza. Uh, it, uh, it is, and, and, and delicious, uh, needless to say. But Buddies, the original Buddies, yeah. is, is where in Detroit? So this one, the oh, come back. Pictures, I pressed the wrong button. Hold on, Go. that was me, that was user error. That's right. <laughs> I think I turned it off instead of forward. Oh, <laughs> Oh, hang on, Tyler's coming to fix we're it. Good. We're good, thank we're you, good. Tyler. Sorry. This is what happens when you let somebody who writes for a living play with tech. <laughs> I think I turned it off when I hit the bottom square. Thank you, see squares. Oh, it ah, came there out. it is. There yeah, so go. Buddies is, well, okay, let me go back for a second because I do think it's important to introduce this idea that it started in Detroit, it escaped via Sean Randazzo and a bunch of other people. Mm -hmm. And then this last or so-called current wave that we're in is people who maybe never stepped foot in the state of Michigan who are now making Detroit style pizza. So I call them the three waves, but the, the first one is indeed Buddies, hollowed ground. There it is. Because it's six and Conant in Detroit. So it's like the Detroit Hamtramck border is a highly industrialized area, but yet, had the corner bars, had the little restaurants that everybody ate at on like a Saturday night, Turtle Soup in, and you know, all these great places like Buddy's that started as the corner bar that evolved to serve food. And so it really was this location around industrial uh, suppliers and people who might have done automotive work that gave rise to this food. It's so it all, it's, it's the sum of its parts. It had to be Detroit. It had to be the Italian, Sicilian, San Marino population to a degree because their kind of 
adherence and adoration of craft, of treating their guests with the ultimate reverence mm. and giving them the best they could give them, and bar culture. You get off work from the automotive plant, you're gonna go get a shot before yeah. you go home to the missus, let's say, or maybe as you know, discretionary income rises after World War II, the missus or the mister doesn't wanna make dinner and you're gonna go out to eat. A sit down place with a thick, beautiful, you know, really filling pizza, almost like a drive-in theater. It's gonna fill up the whole family for not much cost and you get that night out feeling. What year did they did Buddy's open, and, and was it originally a, a bar, and then pizza was introduced later, Karen? This is, is right? kind of the fun of the story, was Buddy's sort of knows its history, you know, the current people who work there. But if you go way back, like I do, and I spend some time in libraries and archives, the family that opened Buddy's has owned it as far back as the early 1920s. Wow. Wow. They would have had it more, though, as like a in that case, a little grocer. So your neighborhood shop where maybe you pick up a few items. So these pictures show Buddy's original chefs, kind of th some of the female members of the Supreme Court as they're known, mm. as well as the earliest waitresses who are as infamous to Buddy's as kind of that food that they served. They really were so beloved for their role. Um, but it really starts with that first generation, which is Joe and Gaspar Jenko. They own Buddy's when it was a little neighborhood grocer and then turned it into kind of that blind pig idea during Prohibition where you're serving something that is vaguely alcoholic or very alcoholic, depending on how well you made your bathtub gin, let's say. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they needed someone who had either like a US citizenship or were, was naturalized in the case of Gus Guerra, their niece's new husband, who could be on the liquor license. They had a silent partner who left at Buddy's, and they needed someone to come in and help them maintain that liquor license. And so Gus was brought in as he had just married Anna, who is the woman there in the bottom photo. That's their wedding photo. Gus and Anna <laughs> are on the side there uh -huh. um, with their best friends who introduced them, kind of a classic blind date. They were in their late 20s. I think Gus was in his early 30s. So kind of a late blossoming romance even hmm. between Gus from San Marino and Anna Guerra uh, that's her married name, is Sicilian. And when they bought into the business, it went from a little corner grocery to that blind pig to a legit bar, and with now three business partners to split the profits, as well as Gus and Anna were starting to have a family, mm. it got a little tight. So they needed another profit center, and food was the way. And so the debate was, you know, could you do fish and chips like a lot of the other bars were doing? What kind of bar food are you gonna serve? And that's where Gus is genius, and that's why so many companies still pay tribute to him. Because not only is he kind of the founder of this, this style of pizza, but he, he brought all the hallmarks to it, the unusual nature of it. And it's based on a Sicilian-style pizza. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to massacre this, so I apologize. I'm Polish, not Sicilian. But it's Scufini is the original pizza. Huh. So kind of like a, a light focaccia-type dough. And then on top, they would mix breadcrumbs, tomato, like a tomato paste, let's say, right. some anchovies, and then you know maybe some, some sauce on top, just to kind of moisture from that thick now kind of topping they would put on the focaccia. And that is kind of a, a early proto, you know, prototype of Detroit style. And Gus, probably in his knowledge of the bar scene, what was faster, easier to make, kind of took this home meal that his mother-in-law would cook and adapted it for the bar setting. And that's where you get the sauce on top. You can see it in that, that scufini there from a place called Bomberitos in St. Clair Shores. Oh, They've been making it, well. it since the 20s. Oh, yeah. So if you're going to try it, it's Bomberitos or a Buscemi's, I guess, also makes a terrific version of it. So if there's a great Italian bakery here, because that's where pizza kind of got started in America is Italian bakeries. You try that version, and you can kind of see where the, uh, the first version might have come from. Hmm. And you blend all those kind of like ideas together, and you end up with buddies. Yes, uh, next you're leading into the, the, my next question here. Yeah, what, what is the, the other uh, two pizza emporiums besides buddies that are kind of the, the triumphant of, of uh, 
Detroit style pizza. You've got Buddies and then Cloverleaf and Louis, right? Yeah, Is that, that right? That's the part when I started writing the book. I admit I'd only gone to Buddies as kind of like a special occasion food and didn't know its history at all. Just knew this is one of the weirdest places. If you ever go to Six and Kona, yeah, oh yeah, it is like a maze because yeah. you walk in, yeah. you go up and down all these different levels and floors, and there's a sub basement where they, you know, put the salad dressing and all the extra ingredients, and it's just a mystery to me how it got started. So one of the nicest things to learn about this story was they're all related to each other. It's like a family tree of pizzerias. Mm. So Gus and the family split in 1953 because somebody is earning more, let's say skimming off a little extra. Oh, okay. And so the partnership breaks up and Gus finds a bar outside of Detroit because he's agreed to move further away. He, the, the new owners of Buddies know the loyalists, the purists are gonna stick with Gus. So you gotta go a little further out. He finds East Detroit, Looks like home, feels like home. It's within a reasonable distance from where they were living at the time. And this is he on buys Gratiot? this little Irish bar called the Cloverleaf. On Gratiot. On is Gratiot. That right? yeah. Yeah. And that's where literally his son and daughter, he had three kids, two are surviving, have their restaurant today. It's still on Gratiot. It's right there. It's been rebuilt after a fire and a couple different iterations, but you can meet Gus's son and daughter because she's the hostess most weekends. That's cool. Yeah, uh. the twins, as I call them, Murray and Jack. Mm, mm. And so it's fabulous to see that. Okay, so that's the second big Detroit-style pizza emporium is Cloverleaf. And Gus runs that with his brother, Michael, who comes in also from San Marino and works with him. And I got to meet his daughters at a book event, which was delightful. So they were kind of, along with Anna and uh, Michael's wife, uh, were the backbone of Detroit-style pizza there just outside of the city limits. And that's actually kind of important because who stays in Detroit and who doesn't is, is sort of a loyalty thing as well. Uh, like who gets the most credit for Detroit style? Are they in Detroit proper or are they on that outskirts? Right. It's really interesting to see yeah. that they developed sort of a, oh, I did it again. Oh, I did it again. <laughs> Press it again. Oh, there thank you. you. Goodness you sakes. It should be easier, shouldn't it? Um, <laughs> but the second generation that owned Buddies, just to introduce them, uh, were the two Jimmy era, as we call it, 1953 to about 1970. And they were both auto workers, much like Gus, didn't really love working in the plants. And they ended up buying Buddies because they probably were customers um, and just enjoyed that, that scene. And they are the ones that developed into kind of a family style restaurant. They added, in my opinion, I, I've never found the documentation, but I'm 100% in my mind sure, they added the bocce ball court. Oh, okay. They added what is known as the card room, which is an area of the Buddy's restaurant that's more, again, family oriented, uh, larger tables, let's say. So Jimmy Valenti, who's little Jimmy, and Jimmy Bonacorsi, who's big Jimmy. And they're, they're, you can tell them apart, not only their physical sizes, little Jimmy is a little bit more of a petite fellow. He's the one in the tie there with the great head of hair. He was always oh. known for his pompadour and his suits. Uh -huh. And then big Jimmy would wear like a dress shirt, dress pants, and an apron. And they held down the fort at, at the original buddies until 1970 when they both wanted to retire as well. Mm. And then who took over after that? So then we have, the third generation of Buddy's owners until very recently, the Jacobs family. And anyone who's really familiar with the Detroit Institute of Arts might be familiar with the Robert Jacobs area of African art. That is the same family. They wanted to call it the Buddy's Pizza area. <laughs> and the really? museum yeah. said, it doesn't sound as classy as we might like. <laughs> uh, we don't really want the, the sponsorship wing yet. Okay. Uh, but through the Jacobs family, so William and Shirley Jacobs were longtime patrons at Buddy's, fell in love with the pizza when they heard it was for sale, had the financial means to buy it. But have no pizza background, mm. never worked in restaurants. Billy was a real estate mogul, had made his money there from literal starvation as a kid to build up to own this you know, empire of commercial buildings. Mm. And then Shirley, his wife, had a background, her family was in interior design, so draperies. And so these two people who had nothing to do with the restaurant whatsoever bought this venerable, you know, blind pig bar that is kind of part of Detroit lore and wanted to do something with it smart. And they're the ones that realized they could build it into other locations. So they expand it through ownership. 
They don't franchise it. They want it to be just like the original buddies. That same kind of like family atmosphere, the same quality of the ingredients, and the spicy wait staff that's going to make your experience like no other. And then their son, Robert, who is an attorney, kind of leaves that practice, agrees to run it, realizes he too doesn't have much of a restaurant background, but there's this kid working there whose mom had been a waitress. He moved his way up the line to now he was like a bartender, understood everything about Buddy's guy named Wes Pakula. Been with Buddy since the mid 70s and he still works there today. He has helped them expand it to the point where they're 20 plus restaurants now, all within the Buddy's universe, like they own every location. So it's really fascinating to see that growth out of, again, Gus Guerra buys into a bar, and then now Buddies itself is a, a big chain and success story. Um, but one of the stories I love to tell, if you will indulge me, please, yes. is the great pizza debate. And this is how the, the family tree gets split into Louis. So when the Big Jimmy and Little Jimmy era at Buddies happens, Little Jimmy gets a call from his favorite niece and says, I just married this guy. We're starting a family, and we need a better job than what we can have where we are. Can, what do you got for us? And little Jimmy says, well, I'm owning this pizza place now. Why don't you and Louis move up to Detroit and work for me? So Louis Tertois, a Frenchman, who family leaves France during World War II, where they have experienced all the horrors of war, from starvation to death to you know, all the things that they saw, came to the United States, and Louis becomes the kind of like top chef in his mind, for sure, at Buddy's. Now, in 1970, the Detroit News decided to have a pizza contest, just for fun, not for any good reason other than the guy who did it, a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter named Jim Trelor, loved pizza. Yeah. And he wanted an excuse to eat pizza. And if you know reporters at all, <laughs> we will do anything for pizza. We'll show up anywhere for free pizza. A free food of any kind, to be honest. Yeah, like. yeah. And so he hosted this, this competition. And if you can see from the photo, all these round pizzerias showed up that, that were invited to compete, including Little Caesars, Mike Illich himself. Mm. Well, Buddy's is the only square pizza that's allowed to compete uh. because they're in the city proper. Oh, you had to be Leaf, in the city. Right. Cloverleaf is told they can't participate. And the family is mad about it to even today. Mm. It's still a bone of contention mm. between them and buddies. Because they were in East Point, you know, formerly East Detroit, they weren't allowed to compete. Now, Louis, I mentioned, has a big ego. He's French, and he's really good at making pizza at this point. He's been at Buddy's since about 1954. When he turns in the pizza to the Detroit News, he makes sure they know he made it. So when the newspaper article ran, it says on it, it's from Buddy's Rendezvous, but the chef was Louis Tertois. Oh. And Buddy's did not like that oh. at all. Mm. Now, in the meantime, the Jacobs family is also organizing the purchase of Buddy's. Louis had wanted to buy it, but he didn't have the money. So now this was the last straw. They won the contest. They didn't give him credit. So he said, I'm out of here. <laughs> so where does he go? He goes down the street to Shields, which was another little bar in that area. Just a hole in the wall, oh, yeah. like probably the size of the stage, no, to be I quite honest with you. It was tiny. It yeah? Was, yeah, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You've been to the original oh, Shields? Oh, I went to the original Shields, yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Now oh. you got to tell me, because I've never been, because it's long past closed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was it like, did you have the pizza? Oh, I Louis had the pizza. It? Oh, it was excellent. It was, it was, I mean, it was a toss-up. Buddies and Shields, for me, yes. were always, you know... I, I didn't prefer one necessarily over the other, but Shields Shields was every bit as good as, as Buddy's. I love that. Yeah, yeah. and it was yeah, it was a real tiny yeah. hole in the wall kind of place. That that was a bar. It just yep. really had that that atm more of a, a more of a bar atmosphere than yeah. than the original Buddy's. Yeah. So uh, Louis yeah. knocked on the door and said to the owners, who I guess are called Big Horse and Little Horse. Never had that confirmed, but okay. great nicknames. I'll take it all day long. <laughs> um, went in and said, I'll run the pizza. You run the bar. I'll keep mine. You keep yours. And it worked for years until the two owners decided they wanted to sell as well. And a guy, Dino, moves in, and he decides, I'm just going to watch Louie make his pizza 
and I'm gonna figure out the recipe, even though Louis doesn't tell anybody anything ever about his pizza. Mm. And one day, Louis shows up as wor at work, according to his family, that's how the story goes, and the doors were all locked at Shields. Wow. And he couldn't get in, and he knew they had stolen the recipe, you know, within a very short order, Ooh. and he had to start over. And that's why we have Louis in Hazel Park. Oh, mm. I did it again, mm. for gosh sake. Okay, there we go. There we go. <laughs> but Louis in Hazel Park looks like this. So in 1977, he bought an Italian restaurant and he converted it to, you know, just a pizzeria with some Italian food. I guess their, their sandwiches were just to die for. Mm. Brings the wait staff from Shields, as well as some from Buddies. Just anybody loyal to Louie comes along. And he opens this place. And then one day on a family vacation, he sees the Chianti bottles hanging in that restaurant. And he loves that idea. So he brings it back to Louie's in Hazel Park. And they start doing the same. So if you walk into Louie's, it looks like a red spaceship. <laughs> there's glitter on the ceiling. I love it. There's all these paintings hanging on the walls that look like Bob Ross did them, <laughs> like the, the happy little trees. Yeah. Louis yeah. painted those. Yeah, really, really. And his family still runs it to today. His grandson runs the kitchen now, and it looks exactly the same. It is one of the cleanest restaurants I have ever eaten in in my life mm. because they have to shut it down, clean all the Chianti bottles. They're so heavy, they took down a wall one time. Mm. So they rotate them all the time through. So it is just pristine. There's always a party. Some kid's having a birthday. Somebody's doing some kind of anniversary or retirement. It is fabulous. But I got to point out, if you know the outside of Buddies at all, they've always had a picture of a ribbon on the wall. Yeah, That's yeah. when they won the 1970 pizza contest in the Detroit News. They painted a ribbon on the wall. So when Louis opened Louis, what did he put on his sign? I won the ribbon. That's my ribbon. My ribbon. And if you go by oh. Louis in Hazel Park, number one since 1954. Oh, That's when it. he joined Buddies. And he's claiming his stake in, in that award-winning so pizza, which I just think. Interesting. If there's nothing more delightful in this world, it's a long rivalry worthy of the Godfather. <laughs> this is our yeah. pizza Godfather story. <laughs> I, I just think that's absolutely terrific. Um, and, and it's those pizzas that are so great that the second wave makers end up creating Detroit-style pizza as a legendary thing. They grew up as kids eating Buddies, Louis Shields all the clover leaf, yeah. and they miss it. So when they move to other places, they got to try to recreate it. And so to introduce some of them, of course, you've got Jet's Pizza. Everybody might know them as like literally the uh, kind of like chain success of Detroit yeah. style pizza. Yeah. Maybe not sauce on top because their ovens are a little different, but still that same crispy crunch, all that delight. That's Eugene and John Jet, two brothers, wanted a pizzeria, decided to go into business on their own and franchise like Mike Illich had. They wanted to be the Little Caesars of Detroit-style pizza, yeah, basically. Their last name, J-E-T-T-S. Oh, Originally Jets yeah, with two Jets. T's, uh, and their lawyer, when they decided to franchise, told them it was too complicated, right. simplify, mm -hmm. single T, and then we get Jets Pizza with more than 400 locations nationwide now. Wow. Super-duper success story. Mm. Um, so it's still family-owned and operated. Uh, by franchisees, but still. Um, and then with Jets, that pizza actually also inspires the third wave makers, which is amazing to me. Um, really impressive history. We have a, another chain called Via 313. This is two brothers from Down River. They love pizza as well, especially Buddies. One of the brothers, Zane, moves to Austin, Texas. And the pizza scene in Austin, Texas is exactly what you think it would be. It's not so great. Not great. <laughs> and so the two brothers decide to you know, write a business plan. They're going to figure out how to make Detroit-style pizza on their own. So they go to a cooking school in San Francisco with this pizza savant named Tony Gemignani. <laughs> and he's like the celebrity chef of the pizza world. If anybody follows pizza, you know Tony. So think of him as like if Emeril and Bobby Flay and, and you, know, uh, you know, all the iron chefs came together and won, it's Tony. So they take his class, and they tell Tony, we're going to make something that we think is a Detroit-style pizza. And he's like, what is that? And he remembers on a trip to Detroit once, he had tried it. And he's like, I think that's such a good idea. I'm going to put it on my menu as well. And that's when the race was on. 
the, the, the Via 313 brothers buy their first truck, like uh, a little place that they can park in Austin, and they start making pizza out of this truck, and the 313 is a tribute to the Detroit area code, mm. and they are so successful that they finally have to sell after their fifth location to a venture capital firm, because they can't keep up with the expansion. And now there are nearly 20 via 313 restaurants. Really? Texas, Utah, you know, more of the West Coast. Uh, that's their expansion plan right now. Mm -hmm. But just wait, there's gonna be many, many more yeah. out of these two. Wow. So they kind of stayed on Zane and Brandon Hunt as the, the kind of symbolic Detroiters mm -hmm. on that team. Um, but there was another chef in that same class named Jeff Smokovich. If you're really into U of M football, that name might ring a bell. He was, oh, well, sorry, Sean. Let me tell you about Sean real quick before we get to Jeff Smokovich. Mm -hmm. All these guys hung out online together. This is when there were chat rooms and AOL groups and things like that. They found each other, these sons of Detroit, as I call them, and they started talking amongst themselves of how could they make Detroit-style pizza because no one at the original three would share the recipe. There used to be this like dumpster diving tradition that if you wanted to learn the Detroit-style recipe, you had to work there and steal it, or you had to dumpster dive and figure it out on your own. So Sean worked at Cloverleaf, and he got their recipe. He ex kind of made his own version, and that's what he took to Vegas with him in 2012. Mm. And he won that big pizza expo competition. He started talking to the Hunt brothers and Tony Gemignani, who was kind of his mentor, and then Jeff Smokovich, and he opens Detroit-style pizza company, and he starts teaching people the recipe. He's really the kind of pizza evangelist mm. for Detroit-style. And then Jeff Smokovich, who played for U of M football, becomes a ski bum in Denver, can't leave because he loves it there. So he opens his own Detroit-style pizza place there after learning the recipe through trial and error on his own as well. Mm. And these guys' success and the pandemic, where everybody is kind of online and living in that world, plus the rise of Instagram, where you can see these beautiful photos of this incredible pizza. Yeah where everybody's trying to get that crown higher and higher and higher and more cheesy, mm -hmm. really changes the scene. Now everybody can make it, whether they live in Detroit or not. So people from all across the world start making Detroit-style pizza and learning from Sean. So the gentleman, the black polo, he's from Louisville. He learns from Sean. Uh, Emmy from Emmy Squared, uh, formerly husband and wife team, mm -hmm. learned the recipe by ordering frozen buddies pizza to be delivered to them in Chicago. Yeah. And Matt Highland is a chef, and he realizes this is the perfect platform to build pizza off of. Emmy Squared goes nuts. As I mentioned, they just opened in Dubai. And then you get people like uh, Francisco Mogoya is the chef for a former Microsoft executive named Nathan Mirvold. They start writing books about food. They have a book called Modernist Pizza where they include Detroit-style pizza as a recipe. And now it's legit. The whole culinary world is on fire, and everybody starts copying it and making their own version. So the escape from Detroit happens from 2012 forward. Sometimes Buddy's Pizza, I think, still is in shock. And, and they don't know, like, how did something that we thought was ours, so to speak, yeah. turn into this thing that the world is completely enamored of? But it's so good. It tastes great. It looks good. It photographs beautifully. Mm -hmm. And so you get guys like Peter Reinhard. He's a bread expert, kind of a, a, a hippie turned spiritualist turned bread guru who adopts Detroit style as one of his favorites. And he's got a podcast called Pizza Quest. So if you're ever like into pizza so deeply, trust me, there's about six really good pizza podcasts yeah. where you can learn the history and then some. And then the gentleman in front of the beer is Steve Dolinsky. He's a news guy out of Chicago. He also writes pizza books, has a pizza tour company, and he starts spreading the gospel of Detroit style. And so between these kind of like luminaries of the yeah. pizza world and Tony Gemignani as well, kind of telling everybody Detroit style's it, you gotta put it on your menu, that's where we are today. Where all of a sudden, Jets went from saying it was deep dish to this is Detroit style pizza. So Jets completely claims it as its own. And you know, a little place called Little Caesars <laughs> starts saying it makes Detroit style Detroit as well. Style. Yeah. So <laughs> on the bandwagon. Yeah. Kind of the biggest kahuna of all, 
Pizza Hut. Look at pizza that. Pizza Hut started making Detroit style pizza as well. So that's when you know you've kind of jumped the shark to use yeah, <laughs> old yeah. fashioned internet yeah, yeah, terms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Pizza Hut, you know, once it goes national like that and they start helping educate people, it lifted all boats, I think. Mm. And all these different brands could really go hardcore now. So I mentioned we lost Sean Randasso to brain cancer in December 2020. He's in his 40s. He's in his 40s. Oh, he yeah. could have, like, I think he would have taken over the world. His mm -hmm. brand would have really expanded quickly. Uh, but his wife, Carrie Randazzo, and his mom, Linda Michaels, are continuing on. And thanks to the strength of things like Pizza Hut and Little Caesars and others adopting this name, this phraseology of Detroit-style pizza, they're franchising now, too. So his legacy will continue in Detroit style. And kind of there's, there's pizzas named after Sean. There's like a whole separate uh, tribute award that they do at the Pizza Expo. So this kid who doesn't even have like, he barely probably squeaked through high school, mm. learned through Dale Carnegie courses how to be personable and run a business. He and others that really felt devoted that this pizza was special turned it into a member of, I would argue, like, if there's a pizza encyclopedia, you know, it's got New York style, it's got Chicago style, you know, we've all had that pizza, yeah. as well as, like, New Haven and some others. Well, Detroit style is considered as important now and it's rock solid as a member of that family. It cannot be taken away. Because there's been a few pizzerias that have tried. They kind of have called it Los Angeles style pizza, or they'll come up with their own version. But if you look at the picture, you're like, that's so clearly a made in Detroit yeah, product. Yeah. Um, and that's partly why too, I meant I wanted to write the book. I wanted to seal its legacy mm -hmm. and seal these makers as the people who really have changed pizza world. And they still debate who's original, who's authentic. They still fight amongst themselves who is the best pizza maker. So it's literally the, the closest knit family and kind of the, the newcomers get brought into the fold a little bit, but there's still that competitiveness. So lots of people making it. I highly recommend trying it all, seeing what's your favorite. Uh, but it's a great style. Like I've had it at Blue Pan, which is the Denver-based uh, group that mm -hmm. Jeff Randazzo and Giles Flanagan created. That's the actual restaurant, that's the pizza. I got to try that in September on a business trip to Denver. It was outrageously good. Really? really? Truly as good as anything I've eaten in Detroit. So it made me very proud that this guy really, the whole bar is decorated like the state of Michigan. It's got all the pennants of our teams. It's got uh, images of Detroit all through it. He's telling the story from mm -hmm. Gus Guerra forward. He's doing the work to make sure the legend that is Detroit-based pizza gets told and it's exciting to see it happen because it's not junk pizza. It's really beautiful and delicious. Mm. And, and there's nothing wrong with a good slice of pizza. So, mm. And that is kind of you know the, the, the long and short of yeah, how does something go from one bar yeah. in 1946 yeah. to around the world six, in that short a time? From Six Mile and Conan to around the world. Oh, right. What, what's your, you, you mentioned the, the it's Blue Pan, you said? Yes. Uh, uh, what, but what, is that your absolute favorite? Pizza? Well, like, if I had to pin you down, like, what, what do you like? Do you, do you want just Detroit style makers just or to, all just of them? Let, let's, let's do D Detroit, you know, area and then yeah. all of them. Like, those two. What, what are your favorites? Well, I think if you're going to be a pizza tourist, which people really do, they come yeah. into town from other states and they'll tell buddies, I'm here from such and such a state because I had to try it at the place of origin. Uh -huh. So, when you go into buddies at Six and Conant, you're going to get as close to the reality of a pizza that's made here from the 40s forward. Probably the only thing they changed from Gus's recipe is the style of saucing. Oh, okay. So you gotta go there. So Gus flicks his sauce on, like off a spoon. So it's kind of spattery, it's all over. Okay. He wanted every bite to have some sauce. At Buddy's, they created the racing stripe. So that you might hear that term of like when you see the long oh, the, red oh, stripes right. of yeah, sauce okay. that are almost like thick lines, mm -hmm. that's because some chef at Buddy's got sick of doing it the longer the, way, oh, okay. uh -huh. the more meticulous, the, yeah, and just yeah. stripe, stripe, get it out of my kitchen. Oh, got it. Okay. And so Buddy's is known for the racing stripes now kind of accidentally. Mm. So there's no like pure method. It's whatever the chef felt like that day. Got it. Um, so you got to try Six and Conant. Right. 
I highly recommend a place called Michigan and Trumbull. Now they're between locations right now because in their old spot in Detroit proper by the old Tiger Stadium, mm -hmm. the rents got raised. If you're familiar with what's happening around Corktown in Detroit, that's where Ford Motor Company yeah. bought the old train station. Yeah. Yeah. The real estate went through the roof. Mm -hmm. A house that probably would have gone for under 100,000 recently sold for like 460,000. It's been renovated, it's gorgeous, don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. But that's how much real estate has gone up there. So they got it kicked out, they're working on their new location right now. But Michigan and Trumbull, um, let me go back to the slide that has their pizza in it. Okay. That pizza there with the arugula on it and uh, the, the, right. the different okay. toppings, that is Michigan and Trumbull. And oh, okay. what I love about them, and what I love about what I would call your third wave makers, is they try everything. Okay. Wild mushrooms, every kind of cheese you can imagine. Um, obviously, the arugula is one of my favorites. That's a that's a picture when we ate there. Um, I love that creativity. Mike's Hot Honey, you know, all the different wonderful artisan makers, they will work local to have the best ingredients they can come up with. It's a husband and wife that opened here. They started making pizza in Philadelphia. Nate is a chef, classically trained. He missed Jet's Pizza. And so he started making his own Detroit style. And it was so good that when they moved back to Detroit, he started making it here. And now they are, to me, they belong in the pizza family. Mm -hmm. um, I love what they do. They've, they've had rave reviews from everybody's eaten there. And what I love is this most recent Detroit style pizza day, which is a holiday buddy started. We had a family reunion. I made them all meet. And we all met at Buddy's and Six and Conant. <laughs> Anybody that could come came. The Via 313 guys couldn't make it because they were opening another location. And I'm like, fine, go build your business, whatever. But Jeff Smokovich and Giles uh, flew in from Denver. We had all the makers there. And what was incredible to see was Johnny Jett is the head of Jets America, the yeah, company. Yeah. And Nate, who runs Michigan and Trumbull, got to meet Johnny Jett, who is like his hero. And Johnny is like the nicest fella on earth, just so humble. Started at the pizza company at 18 when his brother Eugene told him, I know you want to be a doctor, but you're afraid of needles. <laughs> you're going to come work with me at the pizza place. And Johnny's like, all right, big brother, whatever you want. And when G Eugene passed away, Johnny and his two cousins took over, and they're the reason Jets is so big today. So to see Nate in awe, this, this fantastic chef, to meet Johnny Jet in person was like one of my happiest moments. Cool. And then Marie Guerra, Gus's daughter, because of the rivalry, had never been inside Buddies at Six and Conant. Oh. She had been oh. kind of taught that they were the enemy. Mm -hmm. So she'd never been in the bar that her father helped create. So that day she actually got to walk into Buddies and she's been there multiple times mm -hmm. since, which I'm very proud of. She feels that ownership of oh. the space. Yeah, cool. um, so yeah, yeah it's, it's really exciting to story. see them kind of like become a little more family-like. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So yeah, Michigan and Trumbull is a must mm -hmm. when they reopen. Mm -hmm. Got to check them out. Uh, any couple of questions before we uh, have a chance for you to meet Karen and buy copies of the book and have her sign? Yeah, all the way in back, please. We're going to get a mic to you. Hang on one second. Yes, sir. Uh, I don't know how many national uh, pizza um, franchise operations there are, but we have Domino's, we have Little Caesars. I'm not. I understand they're not. Detroit. Now you have Jets. Why? Why all those? It's like uh, the big three automakers. Why? Why in Michigan? My theory is it's a, it's an Italian thing, for lack of a better way of saying it. I think that you can break it out, though. Of like, obviously, Gus is from San Marino. Anna's family is from Sicily. But the in, infusion, so to speak, of flavor into into Detroit proper. So, if you look at the the demographics of Detroit, you have like, and I don't want to call it a melting pot because I don't think we're forced into that cohesion. I think it's more a mosaic of Detroit. Every culture, every country comes for Henry Ford's factories and the Dodge Brothers and, and, and. And when you have that and they're allowed to kind of still live in that world because Detroit had its like Little Italy and Hung Hungarian area in Del Rey called Hunky Town because apparently we're really bad at nicknames. Um, <laughs> there was a German area of Detroit. I think because you could live in your culture, our cultures got to be, 
I think more celebrated, and like many other cities have those areas, and they're, they're celebrated for their food. Um, Chinatown in Detroit right now is a big topic of discussion because there's some buildings that have been torn down um, that were legendary, I guess, and then some that have been bought and are being rehabbed, and so can we have another Chinatown? To me, that's why pizza survives and thrives here. Add in, though, non-Italian, for lack of a better way of saying it, I apologize, uh, but you have Tom Monahan, who's just a heck of a businessman. Say what you will, he's smarter than smart when he realized when I put a pizzeria near a hungry college town, <laughs> it's going to do well. A friend of mine has had the original Domino's because he went to Eastern and he's like, they deliver. You could walk in and get a pizza. Like he said, they called so often, him and his male roommates, that they knew their order when they heard his voice. <laughs> They're like, you want the medium pepperoni again, huh? You know, yeah. like, and so you have that brilliance of him the, the, the Domino's chain of understanding proximity, but also then delivery, and then Mike Illich and Marion Illich. The intelligence of that system of fast, and then more, so you have the double pizza pizza, and then you have the innovation of, nobody's buying pizzas on Mondays and Tuesdays, what do we do? Well, let's mark it down to five bucks. One of their franchisees came up with that. The Illiches heard about it and were like, we're gonna come watch what's happening in your restaurant. And they were seeing people come in and just grab this $5 pizza like crazy. Now it's probably a six or $7 yeah, pizza. Yeah, 649 Thank, I thank you, it inflation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Still but it's, it's our incredible mosaic. It's our incredible food love. I always argue we're stuck inside six to eight months a year. We wanna eat. <laughs> um, you know, we're so freezing all the time. We're gonna sit in a restaurant. We're not gonna sit at home. But I also think it's our innovation. You know, when you have these factories where you have engineers making everything, like in the case of the Ford Wyoming drive-in, the gentleman who owned it was a tool and die guy who has like a dozen patents. You know, that kind of brilliance just mm. walks among us. Mm. Uh, the better made guys, one of their engineers was just a guy who they hired because he was really good at making potato chips. But when a part broke, he would literally, and same thing with New Era potato chips, same thing with Ernest Nicolay, they would just create a part. <laughs> or they'd buy an old factory when it shut down and they'd retrofit it for their factory. So just the brilliance of our mindset from you know, the 18th century, 19th century forward, the age of the city, all that culminates mm -hmm. into making us dough town. That was a, a comment that Wes Pakula, the head of marketing for Buddies, came up with. When I was working on the Better Made book about Better Made Potato Chips, I interviewed Wes, and he said, when are you gonna do the pizza book? And I was like, uh, never, <laughs> but obviously that didn't hold. Yeah. But he said, we're dough town. You've got the Motor City, you've got the pizza places. We made our own music, we made our own sound, yeah. but we also made this amazing pizza. Yeah. Um, so he really wanted this book written for that reason, because we don't get a lot of credit outside of that, this area. Even Detroiters are kind of like hard on themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think outside of the region, people are really hard on Detroit. Like every time I oh, travel yeah. for work, people are like, is it getting any better? Yeah. And I'm like, I, yeah, it is. Yeah. And you I know? think that that tide is turning. I don't you yeah, I oh, mean, for sure. I, I, I think, think it is. I think days, the message has gotten out. Someone's got to be pretty ignorant not to realize yeah. like Detroit's really been coming back for a, a long time now, yeah. you know, and it's got a ways to go. We all know that, but still. How about one more question and then we'll uh, have you buy books. Yeah. Real quick. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, follow up on it. You had a uh, uh, Jenko. Yes. Uh, uh, there is that where the Godfather franchise got their name for the uh, olive oil company? I would like to think so. No, I probably not. It's probably just a Sicilian connection because the Jenkos would have been from Sicily. Um, so Joe and, and Gasper. Mm -hmm. And how about one, yeah, one final question, please. Okay, I can't remember the chronology necessarily, but I know you mentioned that they started in the early 20s. Um, so we had a Great Depression between the early 20s and where we are now. I'm just wondering how they were impacted. And mm. obviously they're, you know, they're still here, but how did they make it through that? Era? Well, those those would have been the years, like at Buddy's specifically, but also like I'll use the potato chip companies as an example, where their brilliance in marketing their products is kind of what kept them in business. So I'll use the potato chip example because Buddy's would have just been a bar during the 20s, for example. They didn't start the pizza till 46 when Gus came in mm -hmm. and started making it. Um, so in the 20s. 
if you were new era potato chips, Russell Dancy, their sales guy, would go to bars, these blind pigs, the underground, you know, serving bathtub gin places and say, hey, I'll supply the potato chips, everybody eats them, they're salty, and then they'll buy more drinks. And the barkeeps were like, well, that's a, that's a good strategy, I like that, you know, so at the same time that, you know, you, you see a, a thing of peanuts sitting in a bar, in Detroit, it was a thing of potato chips because Russell Dancy, in the parlance of a cliche, could sell ice to the Eskimos. Uh -huh. um, so they kind of kept themselves open by just any means necessary, any strategy they could come up with. Um, and I think that's, once again, speaks to Metro Detroit and Detroit itself in the Depression really went downhill fast because the old joke is when the nation has a cold, Detroit has a flu or yeah, the pneumonia, pneumonia yeah, because yeah. we're tied to one industry. And so to me, that's kind of the fascination with this is a lot of these businesses, especially the two food ones that I'm most familiar with, pizza and potato chips, were by guys that just didn't really love working in the auto plants. So they diversified, and that's something that we kind of have to continue to do, you know, whether it's Detroit proper or Michigan as a whole. Um, I'm still writing articles about, for my freelance work, about the brain drain, you know, young people leaving the state. It's because maybe there isn't enough opportunity here. Well, that's what happens when you, you find these like innovators who say, I'm just gonna do it differently and I'm gonna do it my way. Um, I'm, I'm always impressed that this pizza style is why Matt and Emily Highland can both retire. They're the couple that started Emmy Squared. They've since divorced. They sold their um, equity to a large degree in Emmy Squared. It's owned by a privately held group as well. Um, and they, Emily teaches yoga and she's doing really well from surviving breast cancer. And then Matt's starting a new restaurant. You know, but that pizza money's rolling in off of our name. Um, so I don't regret that. My husband's always telling me, he's like, you cannot live in the past, literally. Like, you want everything to stay the same. You want everybody to eat better made and go to the Ford Wyoming and like, Delray <laughs> should still be beautiful because I've written a book, book, book uh, based in Delray, Detroit. But I know that things have to grow and change. So I do not regret that Detroit style pizza escaped and became this wonderful thing. Yeah. I just always want Detroiters and Metro Detroiters and Michiganders to get the credit. Mm -hmm. Karen, congratulations on another fantastic book. It's Detroit style pizza, a Doughtown history. Our, our friends from Book Suite have copies of the book available for sale. Come buy a copy, come get it signed by Karen. Thank you for being here, Karen. Thank you for being here yeah, as well. Thank All right, thank you. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Good job.